God that as we are gathered in this beautiful Sabbath morning in your house, we want to thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath rest. We want to thank you, Lord, for the provision of our salvation, and we want to thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Holy Spirit that seals us, empowers us, and gives us the energy and the direction to spread your word and your gospel as well as your wisdom. So, dear Lord, we praise you, we give you the glory, and we give you the honor. Let us repeat John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world. But he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God said not to come into the world to the world, but to the world to him. And our mission, for you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all the Judea and in Samaria and in other parts. Thank you, Lord. We invite you and we indeed implore you to be in our presence on this your holy day. Not only in Sharon, but all around the world. We're worshiping you on this beautiful Sabbath morning. Amen. So please continue standing for our hymn of praise, Marching to Zion. Oh. The beautiful, beautiful city of who? Of God. Oh God.
Scripture declares the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. But it is impossible to please God without faith. So this morning, dear God, we bow in your presence. And we just pause to say thank you. Thank you for another week. Thank you for your blessings. You have bestowed upon your people in spite of who we are. In spite of who we are and what we have done, dear God, here we are. We are going to pause just to say thank you. 
Thank you, O oh God, for your amazing grace. Grace that we don't even deserve. Because your mercies are new day after day. So here we are. God, this morning we could have been anywhere. You woke us up there, God, in the right frame of mind. Here we are. Still got food on the table. Still got clothes on our back. Still got our jobs. Little money in the bank. We thank you for all the blessings you have bestowed upon us. We thank you for your goodness, your love, your mercy, your long suffering, and your patience with us. Because we are bunch of messed up folk, oh God. So we thank you. struggling. We've been battered and bruised and tossed about. We are burning down, oh God, but the songwriter says, burdens are lifted at Calvary. So we thank you. Forgive us for where we have fallen short this week, dear God. And I said it before, all our unconfessed sins this week, forgive us. Whether it be pride, whether it be arrogance, self-centeredness, gossip, Murmuring, omission, commission, whatever the sins may be. You said that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not some, but all. So forgive us. Father God, not that you forget, but do remember our sick and shedding memories. Amen. Sister Powell, oh Sister Powell, has been through, been through so much. Now it is her daughter, dear God. Sister Ham, Sister Gill, Sister Gay. Great physician, heal the sick. Dear God, walk beside the bedside this morning and touch these individuals, dear God. Let them know and understand that you are still God. So be with us, child. Lord, we thank you for just being here this morning. Oh God, so much. So much is going on. We look around the world, dear God, and we see the signs of the time. And help us to be mindful, to get ready to make our house right. Sabbath after Sabbath, we are here. We need you, Lord. 
God, we need you. We need a word. We need to hear from you. Redeem us. Sustain us. Provide us. Protect us. Heart regulator. Great physician. The greatest doctor. The greatest lawyer. You have never lost a case. You are the same God. You have promised us that you will be with us through the fire. So we thank you this morning. The scripture says that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. So we pause to give you praise and honor and glory. Because you are worthy to be praised. Not forgetting the one that you have chosen to break the bread of life. Amen. Elder Fox and the man of God, touch your man servant. And when all is said and done through this sermon, let Jesus be lifted up magnified and glorified. Hide him behind that old rugged cross. And we will be careful to give you all praise, honor, and glory. And let all God's people say amen. Amen, amen and amen.
Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. We should recognize that all created things belong to God and that we are accountable as stewards. We must take care of his creation. He made this creation for us to live in and enjoy. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 7 says, And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. Numbers chapter 35, 33, you are not to pollute the land where you live because blood defiles the land and the land cannot atone for blood that has been spilled on it except through the blood of the one who spilled it. Even if there is a war going on, according to Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 19, when laying siege to a city, do not destroy the trees, do not cut them down. Trust, time, talent, temple, treasure, testimony, together. And today, Tara, which means earth and land. Dimensions is a measurement of height, length, width, depth, how high, how long, how wide, how deep, have we accomplished the dimensions of stewardship? Tyro. To look after the earth, thus God's dominion, is the responsibility of the Christian steward. Psalms 24, 1. Today is the last day for the eighth dimension of stewardship. I thank you for your time and attention. Amen. Now we pray. Subtract to multiply. For Christ's sake, we pray. Amen. Amen. from the days of your father, you are born away from my ordinances, and I've not kept them. Return unto me, the scripture says, and I will return unto you, said the Lord of hosts.
invitation is given, bringing all the tribes into the full house. But the scripture says that there will be meat. And prove me, God said. He said, prove me. If I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out the blessing. That there will not be room enough to receive. Amen. The hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and the truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is Spirit, and those who worship Him must worship, worship Him in Spirit and in truth. The woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He.
to also pay tribute today to all of our teachers, our Sabbath school teachers, <coughs> and all of the individuals that instruct other people in the way that they should go. Because what you're going to find out is today's message is entitled, One Foundation. Amen. One Foundation. And for those of you that remember, this is a follow-up to the last time I stood here at this desk. And I want to do a quick review about what we talked about last time. And we're going to pick up where we left off. 
And for those of you that are, are teachers, you understand why it's important to build on that foundation. To build on that foundation. Let's ha have a word of prayer as we ask the Lord's guidance. Father, we are so grateful for Jesus. He is the rock. He is our salvation. And it is only through him that we can be saved. Father, let the words of the, this mouth and the meditation of this heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. 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 The devil is a deceiver. Yes. Now, if you remember, we kind of talked about the church of Rome the last time. But I want you to understand we're not talking about the Catholic church. Right. We are talking about a system. Right. We are talking about a system that is broken. A system that is not in harmony with the word of God. And if you remember what we talked about before, the, the faith or the, Rome, the Roman faith that we're talking about or the religion of Rome is based on a little bit of Christianity, a whole lot of Judaism, mythology, paganism, spiritualism, idolatry, and mysticism. They teach from the cradle to the grave seven basic sacraments. Baptism of infants, the Holy Eucharist, at every Mass, every service, Reconciliation or confession where they come and anonymously confess in a confession booth with a priest on the other side of the curtain. Confirmation for adults when they get old enough to understand what they already got baptized about. Holy orders and holy orders so that you understand that includes but is not limited to. Holy orders include people that go to convents where nuns go, people that go to monasteries where monks go, people that pledge to secret orders, mm -hmm. right. and even military orders like the Knights Templar and all of those groups. Some of these groups are subversive. Some of these groups are even violent. But what I want you to understand is that's one of the sacraments of the church. Holy orders. And, and the final one is, is combined between the anointing of the sick and the last rites. And we're going to get back to that later. There are three straight states of the church that the church of Rome teaches. And that is the church militant, the church penitent, suffering, or expectant, and the church triumphant. And for those of you, we're going to go in a little bit today into the church penitent, suffering, and expectant. And basically, those are the people, according to the church of Rome, that have died, and they're not yet ready for heaven, but they're in limbo or right. purgatory. Right. They're waiting to get a little help from your prayers and the right. indulgences that you're paying into the church so that they can get out of purgatory into yeah. heaven. Right. We also talked about the goals of Jesuitism. Yeah. The purpose of the Jesuit order is to bring Protestants back to the mother church. Right. And how do they do that? Through infiltration, assimilation, manipulation, and if necessary, annihilation. The papacy targets four main fundamental beliefs. Four, the nature of man where they teach immortality of the soul. They attack the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers because they believe that every believer should go to confession and reconciliation, do penances, and pay indulgences. Uh -huh. 
They also attacked the law of God and the bogus authority of the earthly church. They used the scripture that says, whatsoever is bound on earth is bound in heaven, and whatsoever is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. And if a person does not adhere to the rules, the regulations of the church of Rome, he or she is what? Excommunicated. Now let me explain to you what excommunication means. Excommunication means that not only are you no longer a good and regular member of the faith, you are also excommunicated and all good and regular members are now to, to shun you. Right. Right. They are not even supposed to have contact with an excommunicated person. Now, that's the foundation of what we talked about last time. So let's talk about the foundation. Who is the foundation of the church? It's Christ. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Nobody has a problem there. So we want to build on that premise that Jesus is the foundation of the church. Jesus said unto them in John, the 8th chapter, verse 42 to 44, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth that came from God, Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, he asked, even because ye cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. We're talking about that serpent, the dragon, the devil, Beelzebub, the deceiver, the, the original liar, you can go with a lot of terms about him. But what you want to understand is this. How does the devil, how does the devil deceive men? Let me explain to you something that many of you probably never even thought about. What the devil wants to do is control the narrative. Let me tell you what I mean by controlling the narrative. Controlling the narrative is telling a story truthfully in incorrect context before someone else has an opportunity to tell it another way with the express goal of distorting the truth or original intent. Mm -hmm. So when a person wants to deceive you, they come to you with something that's not true. Correct? Mm -hmm. So when they deceive you, they come with a little bit of truth and a whole lot of untruth. Right. Now remember, 90% of the truth and 10% of a lie is what? A lie. A lie. Yeah. Yeah. Now, how are some of the ways that they control the narrative? Through the news cycle. Mm -hmm. Many of us sit back and we watch the news every time it comes on. And the news contains propaganda, conspiracy theories, popular falsehoods, and sometimes flat out lies. Another way is through education. Do you understand that in the news cycle even today, there are politicians fighting over what textbooks you can even use in the classroom? Listen to this. All of this stuff that they're talking about that they are worried about critical race theory and all of that nonsense. You know what it is? We don't want white people to feel sensitive about the fact that their ancestors were monsters. 
Now, I know I'm, I, I don't have anything against any white person, but believe me, it wasn't black people enslaving white people in this country. It wasn't white people out there in those fields getting whipped. It wasn't white people who were being denied the right to be educated. It's black people. And the white people were doing this. And so what they're teaching is that we don't want them to feel bad about their ancestors. So let's not tell them that. Critical race theory is a bad thing. It makes people feel bad. So you have to tell the tell a lie to make people feel good about themselves? That's a problem. But what is the other area where they control the narrative? Through religion. And that's what we're going to really take some time today to talk about religion and how they control the narrative through religion. If you remember last time, we talked about Justinian's decree in 538 AD. This decree of Justinian, just so you know who Justinian was. Justinian was the emperor of Rome, but he was the emperor of the Byzantine Empire, which was the eastern part of the empire after the basic empire had already fallen. And the only thing that was left was the eastern section, and they couldn't even call Rome their capital anymore, so they took over a city and named it Constantine, renamed the city Constantinople. For those of you that are keeping score at home, that city now is known as Istanbul. But let's, let's go back for a second. So Justinian's decree, what did it do? It said that the bishop of Rome would be the supreme bishop of all bishops which meant any bishop anywhere in the world or found anywhere in the empire had to answer to the supreme bishop, eventually which became the pope. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. Wonderful. But also in that decree, many people don't know, was the first, fa uh, was the first Sunday blue law. Did you know that? Also in Justinian's decree, was an edict that said nobody can work on the, sa on the Sabbath. And he said that the Sabbath is now Sunday. And basically what he had done, he was piggybacking on what Constantine had already done 200 years before. You following me? So Constantine had already attempted to change the day of worship to Sunday. Because, let me explain something to you. Justinian, declaring that the Bishop of Rome is the Bishop of all bishops, would be like President Biden getting on TV and announcing the new conference president for the Allegheny East Conference, or to declare who the new general conference president is. It's not his place. And Justinian, understood what many politicians understand today. The Christian conservative movement is very, very powerful. There's a lot of Christians out there. How are we going to control these Christians? Make them like us. If the Christians like us, they won't rebel. Now, I, I know you, you, you probably think, did politics really have something to do with that? Yes. And even history acknowledges that Justinian's decree of 538 AD was the beginning of the period we call the times, the times, and the dividing of the times, or the 1260 days or 1260 years of persecution, where it said that the man of perdition would do what? Wear out the saints of God. That's right. And during those dark ages and those middle ages, that's the period of time that a lot of strange doctrine showed up in the church. Now, let's talk about Jesus as the foundation 
Before I get into three, I'm going to deal with three issues to show you how dangerous, how dangerous those times were and what that decree ushered in in that period. Hebrews, the first chapter, verses 8 to 10, says, But unto the Son of Son, he said, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou art loved, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. So what are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus. Jesus was there in the beginning. And when I say the beginning, I mean the beginning and the beginning. The beginning of earth and the beginning of the beginning, whenever the beginning is. Jesus is eternal. Jesus is immutable. Jesus is omnipresent. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. Yeah, that's right. And Jesus is all those things. Yeah. So Jesus is God. Right. God is our Savior. Right. Repeat that after me. I like it when you hear this. God, God is our yeah. Savior. Yeah. Do you know the name Joshua or Yeshua? Yeah. What it means is Yahweh is the Savior. Yeah. That's what the name means. Yeah. And believe it or not, the name Jesus in the New Testament is the exact same name as Yeshua or Joshua was in the Old Testament. Right. And that's the reason why the name Jesus had that meaning. Mm -hmm. Yahweh is the Savior. And, and in fact, you remember the song that we love to sing, Standing on the Promises? Mm -hmm. Back in the late 70s, mm -hmm. the Seventh-day Adventist group got together, and they changed the words to the song from Christ my Savior, standing on the promises of Christ my Savior, to God our Savior, because God our Savior is a better representation of the doctrinal belief that the Savior of the world is God. Right. Right. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6 says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and what? All! And in you all. John, the 10th chapter, verses 16 to 18. The Lord said something really strange. Now I want you to listen to this very carefully because I don't want you to go off somewhere and think that the Lord is saying something he's not saying. John, the 10th chapter, verses 16 to 18, it says, And other sheep I have which are not of this field, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth the Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man take it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. That's right. Even before Jesus was crucified, he stood in front of a crowd of people and said, Listen. I'm going to lay my life down, and I'm going to take it again. This is very important because, see, Philippians follows up on that. Philippians, the second chapter, verses 5 to 7, and you'll see where Jesus picked up where he left off. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be what? Equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Why am I doing this? Because I want you to see the foundation that we're building here. In the beginning was the Word. 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, Him being Jesus Christ. And without Him was not anything made. So if I ask you the question, and you have a quiz on this sermon, the question would be, Where was Jesus during creation? Jesus is the creator. Who breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of man? Jesus. Jesus is the foundation of the church. There is no other foundation of the church. And our youth elder so ably read our scripture today. Uh, uh, thank you, Benjamin. Uh, in John 4, 23 to 26, the Bible says, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in what? Spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God, God is what? A spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman said unto him, I know the Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. She was very confident. She was very happy. And Jesus said, and he did not stutter. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Does anyone have any question about who Jesus is? Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. But Jesus is God. So now I'm going to deal with, show you three things that the devil used to try to deceive people. Okay. Okay. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts, in the, the eighth chapter of Acts, and we're going to read a story. I'm not going to read every verse, but I want to tell you the story before I tell you what we're talking about here. We're going to start with verse 17. Acts 8, 17 to 25. This story is one of the most disturbing stories in the New Testament. It disturbs me. I don't know about you, but it disturbs me. Starting with verse 17, the Bible says, Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So the disciples were out teaching and preaching, and they were laying their hands on people and anointing people, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Mm -mm -mm. He took his wallet out and then started trying to buy the Holy Spirit. Have mercy. Saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be given, be forgiven thee. So, this is the beginning of something that the Mother Church or the Catholic Universal Church is a, one of the most egregious crimes ever that they ever identified. It's called simony, named after Simon. It's called simony. What is simony? Doesn't it sound terrible? Simony is the act of buying, selling, or bartering ecclesiastical influence favors, 
positions, offices, or spiritual privileges in exchange for money, power, or influence. Often unholy quid pro quo arrangements. And why am I telling you about simony? The reason I'm telling you about simony is because simony became one of the biggest problems in the early church. Because what happened is, after Justinian's decree that the Bishop of Rome is the supreme bishop of all bishops, guess what? It became the pearl of great price for all bishops. So bishops were willing to lie, kill, steal, bribe, extort, to do anything that they could to get to that position as the Holy Father. There were popes that had wives, mistresses, children. There was even a pope that had his own army, and he was the general of the army, and he actually led the army with a sword and a shield. Okay, I just want you to hear what I just said. There was a pope that led an army who literally slew people with a sword and, 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 and with weapons. Because what I want you to understand is this. You can call a man anything you want to call him, but he is still a man. The Holy Father is not infallible. The Pope is not infallible. I hope I'm not offending anyone that's in here that happens to be Catholic or Catholic sympathizer but I'm going to burst your bubble right now. The Pope is just a man, just like you and I. And you can tell a Pope that he's above everyone else. And see, what I want you to understand is because the Pope is considered someone above regular human beings, the Pope is considered the vicar of Christ here on earth by these people. And so they believe that the Holy Father is a, is, a, is, is a special person and at the time when they become Pope, they are no longer subject to sin. Mm -hmm. They're no longer a sinning human being. They are now the vicar of Christ. They are the representative of Christ on earth and they are the central power on earth. Mm -hmm. And so let's go back to when the Holy, um, the Holy Roman Empire started with Justinian's decree, what happened there is the state power and the church power came together and suddenly the church and the state became a monster. The Bible refers to it as the first beast. The first beast. And that first beast persecuted it killed, it lied, it changed the, uh, the commandments, did all kinds of stuff. Now, we're moving pretty fast. The second thing that I want to deal with, because you're going to see where it builds the building block. The second thing I want to talk to you about is something called Arianism. Anyone ever heard of Arianism? If you have, raise your hand. Arianism is an influential heresy denying the divinity of Christ, originating with the Alexandrian priest Arius around the third century AD. Arianism maintains that the Son of God, Christ the Messiah, was created by the Father. Therefore, he is neither co-eternal with the Father, nor consubstantial of the same essence of the Father. This doctrine also excludes the Holy Spirit as a person of the Godhead, thus questioning the Holy Trinity. Right. Now, Arianism is not as rare as you may think. One of the most popular denominations that teaches Arianism today would be the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses teach, and I'm, I'm telling you that this is what they teach. 
I am not trying to, to disparage the Jehovah's Witnesses, but this is true. They teach that Jesus is the only begotten of the Father, thus he was the first created angel. Right. Amen. And they teach that the Holy Spirit is a tool of the Godhead, mm -hmm. a tool. And, and, and in the book, The Truth That Leads to Eternal Life, the Jehovah's Witnesses teach that if you want to understand the Holy Spirit, understand a hammer or a screwdriver because the Holy Spirit was simply the tool that the Lord used for creation. Right. Thus, right. demoting Jesus and the Holy Spirit to created things yeah. and the Holy Spirit to not even being a person of the Godhead. And what does that do? Doesn't the Bible say that all sins may be forgiven men and women, yeah. but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the unpardonable sin? So to actually say that the Holy Spirit is not God is blasphemous. Does everyone understand that? And this is the reason why it is so important to understand paganism. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you a quick lesson in paganism. And please keep up because you're going to see something that, ooh, you, you'll see something in, in this. So I'm going to tell you kind of how paganism orient, um, originated and what was involved in paganism. So. Everybody remembers there was a flood, remember? Mm -hmm. And then everyone remembers that Noah had three sons. Mm -hmm. Ham, Shem, and, and Jacob. And, and, and none of you have a problem with that. But Ham had a son named Cush. Mm -hmm. And When Cush died, first of all, Cush was married to a woman named Semiramis. Right. And Semiramis, uh, when Cush died, Semiramis married her son. Mm -hmm. His name was Nimrod. Yep. Now, this is very important for you to understand what happened here. Mother marries son. Nimrod was then murdered. And when Nimrod was murdered by a supposedly a righteous man, I, you know, I don't know this, but, but Nimrod was murdered. And when, when Nimrod was murdered, he was cut up into pieces. And all of the pieces that he was cut up into were mailed to all different places around the world. And Semiramis was absolutely distraught. So Semiramis said, listen, we want to collect all of the pieces of Nimrod to bring him back together so that he can have a proper burial. Listen to me now. They were able to find every piece, every finger, every bone, everything in him except for his reproductive organ. And a few months, well, even up to a year after Nimrod's death, Semiramis was found with child. Listen to me now. Semiramis was found with child. And, and for those of you that think that math is not important, if you take math in school, you know good and well that uh, if a baby is born nine months after a man and a woman were together, you, you pretty much think that it's legitimate. But if it happens 14, 15 months afterwards, You know that something is fishy, right? Yeah. 
So Semiramis had to cover her tracks. So she decided that she would start a mystery religion. And this is the beginning of paganism. And I want you to listen to me very closely. Because God had already told the people of God that there would be a Messiah. And a virgin would conceive. They knew this. So, let's talk about controlling the narrative. Semiramis said, how can I keep the people, because I'm the queen, and I have to keep these people under my control, so i got to come up with a good one. So she told a whopper. That's what they used to call it when, when, when kids told something that wasn't true. They said, that's a real whopper. But this is what she came up with. So what she came up with is this. She said, my child was conceived miraculously and she said that she was, that this, this baby was conceived of the sun god and this miraculous egg came down from the sun god and was hatched from the river Euphrates. And out of this river Euphrates came the child, the miraculous child known as Tammuz. How many of you ever heard of a god called Tammuz? Even mentioned in the Bible. And, 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 and you know what? Um, our first elder is telling me to go ahead and read the scripture. So let me just go ahead and read it. Ezekiel 8, 5 to 18. Then said he unto them, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said, Furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committed here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again, thou shalt see greater abominations. Follow me, folks. And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. He had to peek through this hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. When I had digged in the wall, behold a door. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and I saw and behold every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall around about. Now, so let me explain to you what's happening, then I'll finish the story. You know good and well that only clean animals were supposed to be in the sanctuary, correct? Right. So we're talking about raccoons, skunks, um, um, all kinds of things, pigs, everything else in there. And they're worshiping these things, and they're also sacrificing these things on the holy altars of God. Verse 11, And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood uh, uh, Zazaniah, the son of Shaphan, which every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went, went up. So strange fire is being offered to the Lord. Then said he unto them, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth, shall see even greater abominations than they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, 
there sat women weeping for Tammuz. That's right. Now, why were they weeping for Tammuz? Now, here it is. Here's the story of Tammuz. And I'm getting ready to make a connection here. So, you know, you know the choo-choo train comes and it backs up and then it picks up another car and then goes down the track. We're just about to back up and hitch these two trains together, okay? Watch this. So, Tammuz was the son of Semiramis. And Tammuz, his favorite thing to do, he was a hunter, and he loved to go into the forest and hunt rabbits, funny rabbits. <laughs> Woo! We're going somewhere, folks. We're almost there. Watch this. Tammuz loved to go into the forest and hunt for bunny rabbits. So one day, when he was hunting for bunny rabbits, a wild boar killed him. And a wild boar, for those of you that don't know, a wild boar is a wild pig, an unclean animal. A dangerous wild, wild pig killed him. Tammuz. So, Semiramis had to come up with something real good there. So, Semiramis told the people that when Tammuz bled, his blood spilled on an evergreen tree, and that gave eternal life to that tree, and that's why the tree no longer That's why they said that the tree no longer died in the winter time and the leaves didn't fall off because it was the m miraculous blood of Tammuz. Okay, so let's let's go somewhere with this. Any of you ever heard of a holiday called Easter? Yeah. So let's 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 make some connection here. The bunny rabbit. Woo! They were looking for a bunny rabbit. Woo! Here comes Peter Cottontail. Hopping down the bunny trail. You see that? He was looking for Peter Cotton. <laughs> okay, you, you see what I'm saying? So here is a false god hunting for bunnies in the forest. A wild boar kills him. His blood spills on a tree. Then they start calling it an evergreen tree. That's a miraculous tree because the holy blood of Tammuz fell on it. So how did Semiramis put this together for paganism? She invented something called the 40 days of Lent. Uh -huh. Woo! The 40 days of Lent. That is the period of weeping for Tammuz. Weeping for Tammuz. Now watch this. During that 40 days, people were not to eat meat. People were not to eat meat. And watch this. Then, at the end of the 40 days, the first Sunday after the vernal equinox, there was a big feast called the Easter feast. Mm -hmm. Now, where did that word Easter come from? I want you to imagine a word spelled I-S-H-T-A-R. It's actually, some people will pronounce it Ishtar, but in fact, it's actually pronounced Easter. And all through the Bible, you find Semiramis, who claimed to be the moon goddess. Ooh. So, she was also a god of fertility, a goddess of fertility. Now, now watch this. Rabbits multiply, right? Yeah. Isn't that what they taught us? Yeah. So, fertility. So here you have the, the pain and Easter egg. Where did that come from? So, watch this. The egg out of the Euphrates was decorated, and it was a beautiful egg. So, in honor of Tammuz, the pagans painted eggs and decorated eggs for the feast that came after the vernal equinox. That's what you call Easter's egg.
egg or Easter egg has nothing to do with the Lord. But wait a minute. But wait a minute. It gets better. Come on. Come on. How many of you, when you were growing up, you don't have to raise your hands, went to your family dinner, mm -hmm. and the biggest thing in the middle of the table was a big old ham with an apple in its mouth? For those of you that were rich, but for some of us, the, the ham was a little smaller. But you get the point. So, because it was a wild boar or ham that killed Tammuz, Simiramis said, in punishment for a pig killing the god Tammuz, on that Easter Sunday, we would consume, we would kill a pig and eat it. That's where the ham came from on Easter. Now you can see the fertility goddess with the egg and the bunny. Mm -hmm. Is that enough? But I, but I got, I got it now. I got to put these two cards together on the track. Woo. Is that if that if that's enough, we could sit down and go home. But you got to get this. You got to get this. What is the immaculate conception? Most people, most people believe that the immaculate conception is when. A virgin conceived and Jesus was born. But I'm going to tell you, that is not the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. No, it is not. In fact, the Immaculate Conception is another heresy that holds that the Virgin Mary was free from original sin and that her conception was miraculous from her birth. Thus, defining her as the Holy Mother of God. This is such a blatant contradiction of scripture. Even the Catholic Church wouldn't adapt this, adopt this idea until after the deadly wound. Mm -hmm. The Immaculate Conception doctrine only came into play in 1854 when Pope Pius IX declared during a papal bull, then ineffableis Deus, which basically says the immaculate conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and instituted an annual immaculate conception feast day, usually celebrated in December. Mm -hmm. Now keep in mind, they already teach Assumption Day. Assumption Day is another feast that the Catholics have, and that is the day that they celebrate the Mass of the day that the Blessed Mary ascended into heaven without seeing death. So now, here's another one that they invented. Now, who is the foundation of the church again? It's Jesus. So, wait a minute. Now, if Jesus is not born of a woman, Can he be our savior? Now, I want you to think for a second. If Mary was a perfect woman, immaculately conceived woman, could Jesus really be of the line of David? Could he really be the, the line of Judah? Could he really be our savior? Because my Bible tells me he was in all points tempted just like you and I. So therefore, this is fallacy. This is fallacy. So how does this affect us? How does this affect us? See, what I want you to see is that this doctrine of the immaculate conception goes all the way back to paganism. Paganism. And I want you to I'm coming on in now. I, I'm coming near the end, I, I, you know, but I'm going to share a few things with you. But I want you to understand. How many of you have ever seen someone sign themselves? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so, uh, listen. When they do the sign of the cross, they take their thumb and their two fingers right here, like this. And then that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what does that mean? Well, according to the... Um, the mother church or the church of Rome it is the most reverent thing that a saint can do is to sign themselves showing that they acknowledge the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost but guess what it's a form of godliness wait a minute it's a form of godliness and I'm going to show you why because this is the kind of deception that substitutes true relationship with Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, by saying, okay, you can sign yourself or sign another person, and then that shows holiness, and that's a substitute for real religion. No, it's not. Now, let me show you something. Did you know that there are eight basic prayers already written out, that are already programmed, and that when a child is born in the Catholic faith, some of the greatest cardinals and popes have said, give them to me from birth to up to five or seven years old, and I'll keep them for the rest of their lives. Why is that? Because from the earliest times that they can speak, they're taught the sign of the cross. You'll see a baby barely able to talk, but they know how to do the sign of the cross. They can't even get their porridge in the morning until they can do the sign of the cross. Did you know that? That's how Catholics teach. They teach these children, and they teach the people in the church to do the sign of the cross. But what else do they teach? There's another prayer that's a basic prayer that they teach. It's called the Our Father Prayer. Have any of you ever heard that one? It says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Now, there's a variation. Listen very carefully. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Folks, are you listening? That's a heresy. Why in the world would you hail Mary? This is why. Because that church also teaches that Mary is alive. Mary's not dead. Mary can hear your prayers. And in fact, she is the blessed mother of God. And in order for you to be righteous and to come to the Father, you have to come through the mother of God who is Mary. How many people have ever heard the Hail Mary prayer? Before I even give that to you, I want you to understand. How many of you have ever been to a wedding or been to a Christmas program and heard that beautiful song, Ave Maria? Ave Maria. That is nothing but the Hail Mary prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Blasphemy. And you can tell anyone that still believes that nonsense that Elder Fortson said on December the 3rd, 2022, that that is blasphemy. You should not hail Mary. In fact, when people go to confession, reconciliation, and they go in the confession booth, and they say, Blessed Father, I have sinned. Do you know what they're usually told to do? Do ten Hail Marys over the next two hours so that you can be forgiven of your sins. So the Holy Father or the, the priest it's telling a person, if you hail Mary ten times, you will be forgiven. Now, since when does a man have the right to forgive anyone? 
Now remember we talked about one of the doctrines that they are trying to destroy is the priesthood of all believers. Doesn't the Bible say that you are a royal priesthood? Right. Yeah. And as to the promise? And guess what? My Bible tells me if we confess our sins, yeah. he is what? Faithful and just yeah. to forgive us yeah. for our sins and to do what? Yeah. To cleanse us yeah. from all unrighteousness. Well, how about this one? Have you ever heard a Catholic person say, Glory be. That's a prayer. Did you know that? The glory be prayer. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So when they say glory be, that's what they're talking about. It's another one. The Apostles' Creed. Now, in a lot of churches, even non-Catholic churches, you hear the Apostles' Creed. I believe in, the, in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, on the third day. Let's stop there for a second. Jesus didn't descend anywhere. No. When Jesus died, his body was laid in a tomb. Right. So let me explain something to you. And I, and I hope this doesn't sound sacrilegious, but it's really the truth. God formed man of the dust of the ground. Then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Take away the breath of life, he becomes a dead soul. Jesus was a man on the earth, like you and I. He was flesh and blood. When Jesus gave up the ghost and said it is finished, and Jesus died, Jesus was a dead soul. I know y'all don't like to hear that. But Jesus was a dead soul. Jesus was laid in a tomb. And my Bible tells me early, early on Sunday morning, that an angel rolled away the stone and declared, Thy Father calleth thee. And just like Jesus promised, he had laid down his life, but he took it again and got up. Jesus got up. You know, we have to understand that this is a false doctrine that Jesus descended down to hell. Oh, yeah. Jesus didn't go anywhere. So let me tell you what the word hell means anyway, just so that you kind of know. Most of the times when the word hell is used in the Bible, it refers to a, a word in Hebrew called Gehenna. Gehenna was simply an incinerator outside of Jerusalem where they threw their trash. It was like an incinerator. And when really, 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 really poor people that didn't have a tomb and they didn't have anywhere to bury them, they often took a dead corpse and threw it in Gehenna. Mm. And so the word hell really means separation from God. Mm. That's what it means. But when they talk about Gehenna, they're talking about a, a fire or, or, or fire. But see, this, what you got to know is this. When the Lord said the lake of fire, any thing or any one that's cast into the lake of fire will burn until they're burned up, and then that's the end of them. Right. Do you understand that? Yeah. No one is going to burn for eons and eons and eons and eons in heaven. Mm -hmm. You are not going to be in heaven. You know when you sing that song, Amazing Grace, um, how sweet the sound when we've been there 10,000 years, bright side as the sun, 
and you think that, oh yeah, we've been up here enjoying heaven for 10,000 years, but yet old Aunt Martha is still burning down there now. And she's, she's, she knows she should be nice and toasty by now. You know, that, is that crazy? But, but this is what they have taught. And why am I telling you this? Because I want you to see where paganism came together with Christianity and how people are deceived. And this is the reason why, listen, have any of you ever been to a confirmation for an adult at a Catholic church? One of the things that they assign a person when they are confirmed as an adult is they are assigned a patron saint. And then that patron saint, they learn all the prayers of that pa patron saint. And, and they have all kinds of prayers. I'm going to just share you a, a couple more with you just kind of so that you kind of understand. The guardian angel prayer. Loving God, you are so good that you gave me a guardian angel to protect my body and my soul. Help me to know and follow my angel so that with their guidance, I will be worthy of being in heaven with you. My sweet guardian angel, you are my light every day of my life. Enlighten me to be holy and good like you. Amen. They teach that to the folks. And for those of you that think, oh my goodness, the best schools in the world are Catholic schools. Let me send my child to a Catholic school so that they can get a good education. I'm going to tell you, they're going to get a good brainwashing. <laughs> yeah, I said it. Prayer of St. Michael, the Archangel. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. And they, they do that one. And just so that you know, most of these prayers, when they do it, they do the sign of the cross when they do it. They, they sign themselves as they do these prayers. And many faithful, devout Catholics, they do every one of these prayers at least once a day. Now I lay me down. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Bless the bed that I lie on. Four corners to my bed, four angels round my head. One to watch and one to pray, and two to bear my soul away. Amen. Here's a variation to that one. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Bless the bed that I lie on, four corners to my bed, four angels round my head, one to watch and one to pray, and two to bear my soul away. Amen. There's more. <laughs> now I wait. Now I wait to see the light as God has kept me through the night. And now I lift my voice to pray that thou wilt keep me through the day. Amen. How about this one? The Latin Catholic traditional grace for meals. God is grace, God is good. Good night. Oh, it's, 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 it's another one. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty. Wow. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, how about this one? And, and then, I'm, then, I'm, then, then we're going in. The last rites anointing prayer sacrament. There's a short one and there's a long one. So I'll give you the short one first. So, when you see a priest throw that little sash over his shoulder, and then he pulls out a cross, then he kneels down right next to the body of a person who has recently passed, and they do the sign of the cross. 
And they say, through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who frees you from sin save you and raise you up again. Amen. And here's the longer version of that. Lord Jesus, holy and compassionate, forgive Brother John his sins. By dying, you unlock the gates of life for those who believe in you. Do not let Brother John be parted from you, but by your glorious power, give him life, joy, and peace in heaven where you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Now, as you can see, that's as much as I can give you today because I want you to understand. I want you to take all this in. Easter, Christmas, Halloween. Do you think it's a mistake that Halloween, which is Hallow's Eve, comes the day before a holiday called All Saints Day? Hello? How about Christmas? Where did Christmas come from? Christ's Mass? What is that all about? Well, you know, the emperors of, of Rome realized that, hey, everybody is celebrating these pagan holidays, uh, Saturnalia and all of these other you know the word Yule has nothing to do with Christian Christianity? And I, I'm not even getting into that. But what I want you to understand is when they say Yule Tide hymns, there's no such thing. Yule is so satanic, you don't even want to know about it. But it has nothing to do with Christianity. And, and, and this is the other thing I want you to understand. One of the reasons why they... Um, celebrate Saturnalia and they celebrate around the Christmas time, do you know that the shortest day of the year is right at the winter solstice and then right after that the days start getting longer and that is when they are celebrating the venerable sun god and it just so happens that only a few days after the winter solstice comes Christmas or Christ Mass. Now, listen. I want you to listen to me very carefully because the purpose of my sermon is not to turn you into the Grinch that stole Christmas. No. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to think on these things. Watch what you're telling your young people. Watch what you're decorating in your house. Watch what you are talking about. Watch what you're singing. You know, listen. Reindeer don't fly. Let me tell you something else. In the wintertime, male reindeers shed their, their antlers. So, guess what? All those reindeer that you see with antlers, they would have to be female reindeer. Hello? Because they all have antlers. But anyway, the point is, is it doesn't matter. You see how dumb it is? Now, now watch this. I want you to see something else. All this stuff about Santa Claus, watch this. Anything to discredit God. You better watch out, you better not hide. You know what? He sees when you, you when you're waking and he sees we you when you're asleep. Be good for goodness sake. Doesn't that sound like what you should be teaching your children about God? But guess what? Good without God is the worst kind of evil. Right. And the commercialization of this holiday is an abomination. It's an abomination. And, and, and so I want to talk to you about the fact that 
even when we talk about the three angels' messages, it talks about drinking the wine of the fornication of the beast. What is my appeal to you today? My appeal to you is Jesus is the foundation of our faith. Amen. God wants to know you in a personal way. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man, woman, boy, or girl will open the door, I will come in and will do what? Sock with them. If you believe in God, if you believe in Jesus, if you believe in the Holy Spirit, forms of religion, canned prayers, believing in the saints, and all of this nonsense, listen, let's go back to what I said earlier. It's about deception. It's about deception. The devil is a deceiver. And in closing, I want to say this. I know that it feels better. Many of us have grieved and lost loved ones. And people walk up to us and say, brother, he or she is in a better place. No, they're not. They're not in a better place. But they're going to a better place. But they're not there yet. And what I want you to do today, if you believe, if you truly, 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 truly believe that Jesus is the foundation, the true foundation of your faith, stand to your feet. I'm going to say a prayer of dedication. Father in heaven, your children stand. They stand for truth. They stand for righteousness. They stand because their hearts long for salvation. Rebuke the devil for our sake today, Lord. We know that there is deception on every corner. We know that the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Father, we know that his deception is everywhere. The father of lies is our enemy. And today, we lift our hands and we ask you today that you would bless us, that you would keep us, give us wisdom, and help us reject false doctrine. For your word says that if we submit ourselves to you, resist the devil, that he will flee from us. Nail unto him who's able to keep you from falling and to present you blameless to the all-wise God. Be glory and dominion and power now and forevermore. And all the people of God said, Amen.